It's a, it's a big privilege for me to be here uh, from the Free State and where we are busy with projects in uh, partnership with, with, with you as a church. And, and that's therefore for me a big privilege to be here. And um, maybe just to add some value on the journey that you are on already, your kingdom culture journey, your gospel culture journey, and to share some of that with you as well this morning. Um, me uh, being from the Free State, you can imagine that we don't speak a lot of English. We speak Susutu, but not English. Uh, and when we sang the song that set your church on fire, I thought you meant it literally. <laughs> so I was just thinking if your health and safety you know, structures are in place, if God really does that, you know, uh, set the church on fire. But we are thankful that we are singing about our hearts. Um, so... Um, I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to read out of the, out of the Bible, and uh, I think just to prepare us for this word. It's something special that happens when we read the Bible. It's not just something that we do because it's a good thing to do. God is speaking to us, uh, and it's a wonderful revelation out of heaven, and He has something for every one of us. So let's prepare ourselves through, through prayer while we uh, wait on hearing from God's word. Father, we... We thank you for this wonderful opportunity to, to read your word. Just the fact that we have it is a miracle. Thousands of years you protected it and uh, we have it here today. Help us to value your word. Help us to expect the fact that you are talking to us. It's not just words. It's you talking to us through your Holy Spirit. And we pray, help us to be inspired by what, uh, by what you are telling us to do so that we will not just hear your, your voice, but we will also feel the stirring in our hearts and the fact that you are infiltrating every cell of our bodies. And, Father, capacitate us to really live what we have heard from you every day, not just here this morning. Bless us as a church together and help us to, to really be expectant that... Uh, Something, something is happening in our midst every day and as well this morning. We thank you for your word. Bless us, inspire us through your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so I'm going to read a, a passage before we start. Um, and this passage is from Ephesians. There you have it on your screen as well. It's from verse... Uh, verse 2 to 6 that we're going to focus on, but verse 2 starts a bit uh, in, in, in the middle, so I'm going to read from verse 1, it's from the NIV translation, and it helps us to guide us into this discussion of understanding a kingdom culture, and then Paul says through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's talking to the church, he's talking to us, he says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. So he's talking about this worldly culture that's greatly influencing all of us. Uh, not just people out there. Um, everyone is influenced by this culture of this world. All of us also lived among them at one time, uh, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. We were supposed to be punished for the way we were living and maybe for the way we are still living because all of us still continue to sin in this culture that we are uh, part of. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. God came to change the whole story of this earthly culture. And he says, God made us alive in Christ. And the way he did, us, did this is, and he raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. Realms, how do you pronounce that? Realms. Okay, thank you. Uh, in, G in Christ Jesus. So he seated us, we rose with him, he raised us up and seated us in heavenly places, or if, as you call it, uh, realms uh, here in Longabon. Um, 
that in the free state means the place in heaven. Uh, so that is, is, is um, the word of God that we are starting with, and it's the, the, the foundation of what we are going to discuss um, this morning. I said earlier as well, we still depend on, on the written word and small books, and uh, we don't trust the technology. They say it's like uh, serving idols, because the moment you trust, put your trust in technology, it uh, disappoints you. Uh, so... Um, it can, happen to, it can happen to me as well, and therefore I use this. Now, you are busy with this journey of uh, gospel culture, a new culture, kingdom culture. And I think that's the desire of every church, actually, that we want to be involved in bringing change to the communities where we, are, where we live in and where God positioned us to be. Uh, that's at the heart of every church and every church leader and every uh, people, every person participating in church. We want to see our communities changed. We want to be busy with things that will bring hope to wherever God has put us to be and to live. And therefore, because we, we have this desire to bring change, we as church normally starts with different projects to infiltrate the communities. And those projects, we, we, there's a lot of different projects. There's feeding schemes, there's uh, projects where we start groups and Bible study groups. There's projects where we pray for the communities, where we create jobs and CVs and all those kinds of things and educational projects. So there's a lot of things that churches do. And actually, we bring a lot of change in the communities as it is. But the problem with projects is normally that it's not always a continuous influence. Because projects depend on... On money, uh, many times money dries up, economy changes, and uh, many churches, you know, close some of their projects because of that. And and then of course projects is uh, projects are very dependent on on people. Uh, and as soon as a leader moves away from a project, it it often happens that that project also collapses. So we 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 don't succeed many times in in continuous influence through projects. But what we see in, in this world that we live in is that there is a way to influence on a sustainable level uh, the communities around us. And that is through the change of culture. Because as soon as the culture of people changes, then they have that ability to continuously influence the communities they are in. Because culture becomes part of you. It's not just a project. You're not just busy with something. You become the project. And when your culture change, you change, and your, what you say and what you do becomes part of that culture and the values that you believe in. And they, therefore, it's very important when we are talking about change, when we are talking about influence, we must think about this topic of culture. And now we will be able to have a changed gospel culture or a kingdom culture so that we can continuously impact our communities. Now, what is a culture? A culture is uh, shared values that people share in a certain group. Um, don't worry, that doesn't uh, bother me. Um, we have shared values. We have a shared goal. We have a certain way of understanding things and we share that with each other. And because that, those values are part of us all, all of us, we are able to, to achieve certain things because it's our natural way of living. It's our culture. Now we see this happened in the Bible, the fact that God used culture to impact the world. When we read, for instance, Acts 2, we see that after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, people changed. Their way of living changed. They didn't only start to, you know, uh, have Bible study groups or build churches. Everything that they did changed. They changed the economy. They changed the way they looked after each other. They changed the way they talked. They were simple people. But God came and changed their culture in such a way that they, will, uh, they were able, able to overthrow, overthrow the whole uh, the, um, what do you call it, the uh, regering, just shout it out, 
Roman government. So please, if you see I'm stuck, just shout it out. It makes it a, makes it a learning opportunity for all of us. Um, so they were so effective in this changed culture that they were able to change the culture of the world. Now the Roman Empire was not the ANC that ruled more or less all of the regions in a country. They ruled countries. And now God changed all of that through simple people. Uh, and, and that's impressive. And that shows us that culture and the change in culture can really bring that influence. And especially when we talk about the godly culture where he's behind the culture. Where he's the driving force in that culture. We read, for instance, in Acts 17 verse 6 that, um, that, God, uh, that the church were accused of overturning and turning the whole world upside down. They, they, they brought them to court and say, listen, these Christians are turning the world upside down. We must stop this. It's a threat to our community. So this culture was not just a message. It was not just somebody uh, you know, speaking uh, publicly on a corner somewhere, uh, on a street corner. It was a culture that was so impressive that it threatened the Roman way of living. So that's something very powerful. And that's what we are discussing here this morning. We are not discussing a, a small tweak. Uh, something different. Just read uh, another passage in the Bible or pray five minutes longer. It's a whole system change. It's not just a revival. It's a reformation. And that's what happened in the Bible. People changed in such a way that he brought change every place they, they went. And they were actually the people who suffered persecution. They were not on the forefront of this whole thing. But God changed that. So that is what culture can do. A continuous, sustainable change in the countries. It actually changed the whole history of the world, the fact that those Christians changed into the culture of, of God's kingdom. So what is the problem with South Africa? I mean, we have 80% Christians living in South Africa. 80% people indicate that they are Christians in South Africa. We are one of the countries with the highest percentage of Christians in the world. So what's wrong? Why are we seeing corruption? Why are we seeing violence? And we are so good at violence that we are in the top 10 of the world. We are very, very effective. Uh, why is that true? While we are actually saying we are Christians. And I think the problem lies in the way we think about what Christianity means, and what we are talking about when we are talking about the Christian culture. We say that we have a Christian culture, meaning that there is a, a foundation of Christianity, but what we see is different. So, can I just have that first slide, please? So, the reason why we don't see our Christian culture changing our communities is, is because we have this worldview, or this view of our faith. We all believe... In, in this world that it's our reality from where we live and then we believe in this heavenly reality. All Christians believe that. That there's Jesus Christ, there's the Father and the throne and there's the Holy Spirit. All of us believe that. The problem with this is, is that there's a big divide in our understanding between earth and heaven. So what actually happens is we believe in heaven but we believe we will only see heaven when we die. For the rest, we have to live here and fight for survival. And hopefully, God from there in heaven will help us to, to manage and to survive. So that's how we see our faith. There's a, a big uncertainty on, on whether God is really involved in everything. And, and from this perspective, what we do here is influence God's reaction towards us. So when we're good, we feel close to God. When we're bad, which happens to me a lot, we feel far from God. So it's always this close and far, close and far situation. And, and we are not always sure that God is with us because many times we feel we don't deserve it, that God must be with us. So that's our way of understanding. So there's a lot of distance uh, between God and ourselves. The other problem is, with this understanding 
although it seems very clear or, or simple to understand, is that even as Christians, our earthly realities influence us more than our heavenly reality. Because we only think we're going to get there when we die, remember? So for the rest, it's is, is, is our life here on earth. So even though we are Christians, if you grow up in the Cape Flats, your reality and your truth and what you think about life is very different from people growing up in Langebaan or people growing up in Clifton or in Johannesburg or, for instance, in the Free State. There's a vast difference in people's understanding of the truth. What people in the Cape Flats think about who must rule this country and what they think must change in our economy to benefit them is far different from people staying in Sant and in Joburg. Although we are all Christian, different realities, different solutions to the problems. And that just shows us that our earthly situation is sometimes influencing us much more than the fact that we are actually Christians. We even see it in South Africa that Christians fight each other. Even when you have these uh, strikes, you see people confronting each other uh, and sometimes violently, although most of them uh, taking part in this protest are, are, are Christians. That's actually something very astonishing that this, these things can happen to us. And that just shows us that our earthly realities are, are more clear to us or more influential to us than our heavenly. We even speak like that. In the Cape Flats, hey, my bro, and if you go there to, to, to Pretoria, it's my pawn, my mourn. You know, like that. They talk like that. The, the, the whole thing is different. People look different. In the free state, it's only khaki clothes that you go there. <laughs> you don't see these different colors that we see here, the, the variety that we have here this morning. So our whole reality, realities that we live in are influencing us a lot. And that causes us to, be, to, to, to experience a lot of division in our country. And that's our problem. We are actually united in Christ, but we are worlds apart. And we don't, we are not able to access this unity that we want in, in Christ. Therefore, we see, uh, we see so many different churches. Even in the church, there's the vision because of where, my upbringing. I like the organ, you like the violin, and those guys like the, uh, the drums and the stuff that we see here. And people are so concerned about those things, it's so important to them that they even split churches. I want to reach that group. No, we want to reach that group. We split the church. We actually fundamentally one, but in our experience and in our realities, we are worlds apart. And the fact that we live from this reality and this reality imprisons us, it also influences uh, our expectations. And that's actually the worst part of it all. As Christians, believing in a powerful, almighty God, because we are so trapped in this world, we start to expect the things that's a reality in this world. Sometimes even as a church, we will start projects with our mindset, thinking that it can only influence such a small group because it, it depends on our funding and it depends on our manpower and now we think small. We don't expect, I mean people come to church, they don't even expect that they're going to change the town. You don't think because you are here, Langebaan is going to look different next year. You don't even expect that anymore. We expect, yes, sorry, uh, th there's nothing there that I want to uh, explain. <laughs> I just want to see if you're all awake. But anyway, uh, we don't expect that we're going to change this place. And that is sad. We are so trapped in this reality. And therefore, people don't even endeavor in going over this uh, barrier of moving into this godly reality because we are trapped there. And sometimes we fight in our meetings over what is possible and what's not because we are imprisoned by our earthly realities. And, and we want to see Actually, when we think of solutions, we, we bring earthly solutions. Um, the other problem with this reality and this, the fact that we live in this dualism, it's earth and only afterlife in heaven, is that there's a small difference in culture between believers and non-believers. We're almost the same. 
And therefore, our influence is, is, is so little. Uh, I mean, we strive for the same things. We are just as racist as non-believers. We are just as negative as non-believers. We are just as materialistic as non-believers. We go for the same things. The same thing scares us. So that's why we don't have this influence, because we look alike. The only difference between me and a, and, and a non-believer is I go to church on a Sunday while they play golf. Sometimes I think they have the better part. Uh, well, here we don't have that much nice weather and wind and stuff, but I mean, they're in the free state. It's every day you can play golf there. So um, I don't even play golf, but um, yeah. Um, and that's our problem. Our, our culture doesn't have influence because it's almost the same. And people can see that. They see the only thing that we have is a different message, a different theory. But there's not a different practice. And that's where we get stuck. And of course, um, from this earthly perspective, the goal for a Christian is to get into heaven. So a lot of our activities are based upon how do we prepare people to go to heaven? How do we help people to get closer to God? Because God is far from us and we have to change our behavior so that God can be satisfied with us and, and then we have an open relationship with Him. So we have all these things in helping people to grow closer to God. Because He's far and we are here in heaven. And that's why we are so focused on our own faith that we don't have time to actually get to the job of influencing the community because we are already into, in a relationship with God. And that uh, causes us to sometimes lose our effect and impact in, in, in the community. So that's, that's the story. Um, although we are Christians, we are so imprisoned here that we don't have that impact as a culture. So how do we change that? How do we change this culture that is almost similar to the world's culture? And the only way to find out how we do that is to see how God did that. How did God change the culture of people to influence the world uh, in the Roman times, in the, the early church? Can we have the next slide, please? So what we see that God did firstly is, is what we read in, in, in Titus 3, verse 4 to 5. There we see, we read, God says, you are saved by grace. You contributed nothing to that. It's by grace that God uh, gave you a new birth. You were reborn in Christ through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So firstly, God comes to us and says, listen, I've changed the whole story. I, I'm not going to put something new into your life like downloading a new uh, program. I'm going to give you a new birth. A whole new person. So that you can live in a new culture. So that's, that's what actually happened through us. That we were born again in Christ. Now to understand that practically. We, we read for instance in Ephesians 2 verse 4 to 6. The passage that I've read just before we started. That what happened actually is we were far from God. We were trapped here. And they, there was a big uh, you know, divide between ourselves and God. We were there. But then Jesus, when he, we died with him and we rose with Christ, and he says, he gave us a new position in heavenly realms. How was that? <laughs> in heavenly realms. So, so God changed our position spiritually. Although we still live in our fleshly bodies here, spiritually we changed positions. We change from earthly citizens to godly citizens. That's what we read. If we read further in verse 19, Ephesians 2, he says, Now we are not foreigners anymore in heaven. Before Christ, there was this boundary there. But now, and we were, we were uh, citizens here and foreigners there. But it changed. Now we are citizens. We are um, part of the household of God, says uh, Ephesians 2 verse 19. He Hebrews 11 verse 13 says, Now we are foreigners and strangers on earth. So the whole thing changed. There's not a similar culture, 
You are now a stranger to the other people in this world who are non-believers. That's what happened. It's a whole culture thing because there was a, a shift in position that we live spiritually now in the presence of God as heavenly citizens. Um, God says in Colossians 1 verse 13 that He actually forcefully removed us from the power and the uh, influence of this dark world, of Satan's influence, and He put us under the authority of Christ. So we moved places when we got saved, when we were reborn in Christ. There was a change happening in our citizenship. Um, and, and, and we read in Philipp Philippians 2 verse 20, it says, Now you are heavenly citizens. So it's not like the Old Testament anymore. It's not like some Christians still today practice that you are here and your obedience gets you closer to God and sometimes He's far and sometimes He's close and nearby. That's not the case anymore. We moved from the, there to the presence of God in, uh, to live as heavenly citizens. Now, how is that possible? Because I know myself. I mean, I'm a sinner. I'm sometimes flat out in the wrong direction, uh, passionate about the wrong direction. Uh, so how is it possible that a person like me and you can go from here to there? Because God is a holy God. He's a righteous God. We don't belong there. We don't belong there. So how is it possible? It's possible because when we moved through Christ spiritually to our new position, something happened. We changed. We are not the same people there anymore. He said, He sanctified us. He made us holy. We are holy now. Now sometimes, I even went to a retirement village the other day and I asked people, who of you are holy? Now some of these guys are you know, a few days away from meeting God personally. Uh, so you might think they are, you know, very well prepared and almost there. So I asked, who of you guys are holy? None. No, we are sinful and we are this and that. So it means that the foundational truth of Christ, the fact that we were made holy, we don't believe that. We still think we are the person that we see in the mirror. God says, listen, I've changed you. Holy means Without blemish. It says there directly in, in, in Colossians 1. Without blemish. Without reproach. Meaning God cannot even accuse you of something anymore because the whole sacrifice of Christ was complete. He didn't change you halfway so that your wife will enjoy you a bit more. You're a bit more on the straight and narrow now. You are completely changed. Holy. You know the word holy means godly amazement. Meaning when God sees you, and you have to change that perspective in your mind, He's amazed. He says, wow. In Sephaniah 3, it says, God dances when He sees us. If you look at the direct translation out of the Hebrew. That's how God uh, feels when He sees you. Not the person in your mind who think, I'm not good enough, God is angry with me, I know who I am, I don't deserve anything. God says, I'm amazed. And therefore, in Colossians we read that we were announced into the presence of God through Jesus Christ who made us holy. He invited us into His presence. You know, in the old times, you couldn't just get into the presence of a king. There was an announcer at the door. And when there was a function, names were on the list. And they were, you were... Get there and he says, okay, listen, who are you? And if your name's not on the list, there's, there's no chance you're getting in. And then, through Christ, he's the announcer. You come in prayer before God, and you must see this when you pray. And Christ, the King of Kings, says, welcome. And he says, ladies and gentlemen, and all the angels in heaven, I announce in the presence of God. And then he says, says your name. And you walk into God's presence and He says, wow, I cannot believe what I see. And therefore we read in Luke 15, for instance, there's a feast in heaven for everyone that uh, gets saved through Christ. Because you, you don't just change here, you are moved into, the, into God's presence. You have a new home and there's a feast. And you must see that feast next time you pray, your name on the table and millions of millions of angels singing and rejoicing just because you are there and just because you believe it. 
That's something amazing. So that's what happens to, with us when we move into God's presence. Not only are we holy for when we are good, we are holy always. Even though you're going to commit sin in your future. Because Hebrews 10 verse 10 and 14 tells us we've been, ha- we've been made holy forever. Nothing can change that. We've been reconciled with God. You will never be closer to God than you are now in Christ. You're not going to be closer to Him when you go to heaven. We've already been reconciled with God. There's no moving up and down again and now we are close and then we are far because we are holy. That's why Christ died for us. That's the reason. So it is not only a future reality, it's now reality. And of course we know Jesus came to make us righteous. Meaning He fulfilled all the laws. All the things that we had to do to make God like us or to be satisfied with us, Jesus did it on our behalf. We can stand up straight in His presence and we know God says, I'm satisfied with you. Because you did what I expected from you through Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's the good news. People like us can be there. Because we are holy and righteous. Now we are heavenly citizens. And that's why Jesus calls us heavenly citizens. Because we have been made holy and righteous. And therefore we have a place in God's presence. uh, Justified. And now we, 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 we know that we are clothed with Christ. That's the justification. Jesus, His, just, uh, his justification, he, he clothed us with that so that we can be that forever in, in, in Christ. So people, we are not going to heaven when we die. We are heavenly citizens as we speak. Uh, John 5 tells us that. They see you already moved from this life, from death to eternal life. Already. Over the bridge. You live in a new country. You don't have to wait for your place in, the, in a cemetery. That's a begraf plaats. No. You already died when you came to Christ. Your death is behind you. Therefore, they couldn't scare the people of, those, of, the, of the early church. How do you threaten somebody with life in heaven? If they know they already died, it's behind them. That's why they were so passionate and, and it was impossible to scare them because they understood this reality in Christ, our citizenship. So this new reality, this new position in Christ becomes our new reality and therefore we are influenced by our heavenly reality as Christians and therefore we can uh, develop a new culture because we are exposed to new situations and new wonderful things in God's presence. And therefore it impacts us. We don't change ourselves. God says in, in 2 Corinthians 3, He says, You are being transformed into the image of Christ by God. All that we have to do is to stay there in God's presence. And we will experience that. Because that is so overwhelming that it's impossible for us not to change. So if you see somebody who struggles to change, change it's not that they don't have enough uh, self-control. It's the fact that they try to change themselves from an earthly position. And therefore, we, will, we need to help people to understand they are there so that God can change them. God can bring this culture into our community in a sustainable way because that's our new reality. We don't live as Christians because we try to impress people. And when some, something bad happens, we pour uh, like a little Christian soci, what is that... Uh, Source over the whole thing and say, ah, don't worry too much, God is there and da, da 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 No, we live differently because we live from a different reality. Paul can sing in prison because he experiences God's presence. He didn't tell Silas, he said, listen guys, we have to do something religious here. I mean, we're in prison, we're in deep uh, trouble here. Uh, <laughs> luckily I said trouble, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, let's just take out up a collection, send out the bucket around so we do something religious. No, they were singing because the, the kingdom culture was in them. They were singing from a heavenly position, not from the prison. And therefore, that had power. God doesn't put His whole kingdom on your shoulders. He changed you so that 
until it becomes a passion for you to live a different culture. In everything you do. Not when you're at church, when you're at home, when you're in your marriage, when you're uh, with your children, when you're busy driving around. Everything is influenced because of your new reality in Christ. You are holy and righteous in God's, in God's presence. So now, the next slide, because that re- of that reality, something wonderful happens. For every person that gets saved through the grace of Christ, God is doing something. He says there in Matthew 16, verse 18, when, when Peter says, he's Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior, he says, well done, Peter. Uh, I will build my church on this revelation, on this rock. So God says, it's not the pastors that builds the church. He will build the church. Jesus will build the church. For every person that gets saved, and, and, bring, and, and, and when God brings them into position in, his, in this heavenly places, He's building His church. And what happens now is, instead of all the differences that we have here, we all look the same. Because we're all covered with the same glory. We all uh, have been made holy through the same Christ. We all have the same righteousness of Christ. We all have the same new reality. Therefore, there's no divide because I grew up in the Cape Flats and the other guy grew up in Bloemfontein. Because we meet each other here in the kingdom of God. And because of that, we, we become a family. We become the church. And therefore, God can use us to bring this continuous uh, impact into this world because we are, we are the same. We speak the same language, the language of love, which everybody can understand. And through God's grace, we have now this energy to embrace each other. Uh, Ephesians tells us that, um, Ephesians 4, that now we share one hope, one spirit, one baptism. Uh, We are exposed to the one thing that is God. All of us in the same way. It's not different for Basutu people and then for English people, you know, they have a a different exposure to God. The same thing. And therefore the early church were able to unite in such a way that although they were from different nations, they could do this thing because they were in position in God's presence. And they didn't try it from here where they had to convince each other, ah, no man, like your brother. Come on, don't be like that. Forgive him, although he's a Mexican. (laughs) There's no way that you can force people to do certain things. But if God does that, it's it's a whole different ballgame. We read in the Bible, for instance, that um, Jeremiah said uh, uh, he, he was facing such hardships that he, he decided not to speak about God anymore. And then he says, it became like a fire in me. I couldn't keep quiet. And that was, that's what happens there. In God's presence, there's a fire burning. Luckily, he has the health and safety stuff going on there uh, to protect you. And it's impossible if you touch fire not to change. I've seen many people in contact with fire. It's always the same reaction. When you fall into a fire, you don't sit there and tie your shoelaces first and say, listen, I just don't want to fall over my shoelaces when I get up, jump up here, so I let me first tie. The moment you touch fire, you move. And that's what happens when we get into contact with God. The Spirit changes us. Even the sin in us gets changed. Not because we are so diligent and, 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 and so full of discipline. Because the Spirit moves it in us. That's the promise of this new covenant. God says there in Ezekiel, also in Jeremiah 31. He says, I will put a new heart in you. I will take out that heart of stone. Not you. Not read your Bible until you have a new heart. Get into position. Believe what Jesus did. That's the gospel. And God says, Before you know it, I will put a new heart in you because you are exposed to my spirit. I will sprinkle my living water over you, he says, and I will move you to do my will. Not you. Not try your best. I will move you. Please don't try and change things from there yourself. Pray. And I ask God, Uh, A lot of times, I say, God, I don't have a heart for these things. Give me the heart. I'm not going to move because I'm going to make a mess with my understanding and my passion. 
God, please help me to love the taxi drivers there where we go to Pretoria from the free states. Not easy. <laughs> they take opportunities that's not there. I don't like those people doing that. It makes me angry. I'm from the farm. And that God has to prepare my heart to say, love that person. Show him it's alright. Please take the opportunity. <laughs> that's what God can do. The free state in me cannot do that. And that's what God does for everybody. Because we have the same exposure. And in the end, the glory belongs to God because people know it's not you. It's not possible for a person to do that. It's not your commitment. You are trying so hard. You're almost Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa. Uh, it's because of Christ. And that is our new reality. And that becomes our new culture because we are exposed to that. It aligns our purpose not to be busy with how do I change my relationship with God. It's understanding it has been changed. I accept that. I am saved. I am holy. I am righteous. I am in God's presence. I'm not trying to get closer. I can relax about that. Now, uh, it's all about making that reality visible here on earth. Because that's why we are here for. Because Jesus did it all. Um, and because we, um, we live in that reality, it's easy for us to forgive because we stand in the source of forgiveness. Because we are there, it's easy for us to love. John says, 1 John 5 says, the laws of God, is, they are not difficult anymore. Not because we try from here, but because it's now in our hearts. And therefore, we can, we can share and we can do all these things and we, we, we are being changed into the image of, of Christ. Uh, and it's a viable thing. It's continuous because the source is continuous. It's not here where we try our best. Can I have the next slide there, please? Um, great. So this is what now happens. Acts 20, verse 22, Paul says, I'm going to Jerusalem bound by the Spirit. Bound by the Spirit. He doesn't want to go to Jerusalem. They're going to catch him there. And there, was, there, there were prophecies about his life. Say, they're going to tie you. Take you to places you don't want to go. You knew that before. Beforehand. Before, beforehand. Which one? Ah, it wasn't clear. Which one was it? Ah, oh, both. Oh, beforehand. All right. Now you actually have to sharpen your English. Um, <laughs> but he was able to do that because he was bound. By the Spirit. If you read that word, it, it actually means it's something like a dwarf being connected or uh, tied to a giant. When the giant moves, the dwarf goes along. And that's what's explained there. Paul says, I don't have a choice. I'm going. You can't convince me. I will go there. And that what ha that's what happens when we... When we uh, Understand our position, God says, I'm going to start moving you to do things that you didn't want to do before. That develop a passion for things that you didn't have a passion in the past. Because I'm going to move you. Galatians 2 verse 20, Paul says, I'm not living anymore. Christ lives in me. It's not about me. Because I died in this whole process. And I came alive in Christ. And that's what happens um, to us and and that's the wonderful news. Now, all of a sudden, we can influence this world. You can see this, this culture starts to come alive here because God has changed us there, exposed us to His, His kingdom culture. Now it becomes a natural thing for us to think different, to talk different, to d make different decisions in my business, in the way I talk about people and politicians. Now I can start pray to pray for people even if I don't like them because God changed me uh, there. All of a sudden, we are not the victims on earth anymore. We are not here to survive all these difficult things. We are the victors. We are the ones that brings the authority, the victory, the change. And that's the, that's the, 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 the wonderful thing of, of all of this is that, is that uh, when we read, for instance, Matthew 16, verse 18, God says, after he says, uh, Peter, I will build my church. I will build my church, he says, uh, and the gates of hell 
will not prevail against you. He's talking about poor, uneducated people following him. And he told those guys, he said, listen guys, you might think that you are not important. You might think that you have no capability to influence anything. I'm telling you, even the gates of hell, the whole uh, structure and, 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 and the, what do you call it, authority or the reign of Satan in this world will not be able to stand against you. We're not here just to, to, to try and fire each other up a bit so that we survive un, until next Sunday. We are here to, to, to listen uh, and to understand that when I go home and tomorrow, there will be change at my office. There will be change in the way I treat people. There will be forgiveness. There will be new strategies rolling out in the communities that I'm involved in every, in my everyday life. The person at the fuel station, the person in the shop, everybody will see the difference because there is change. And this change will influence. It's not a soft voice in the back of the room. It's the King of Kings coming alive through you. Looking more and more like Christ. And that's the culture that we are part of. It's not something artificial. It's a reality that we live from. And God says, this world will not prevail against us. That's a promise. So we can expect change. We can expect it. Because we live from a different reality in God's kingdom. Although we are still in our earthly uh, uh, in an earthly position here. Now the last slide shows us a key. After God says, uh, said that uh, the gates of hell will not prevail, He says, and I'll give you the keys of my kingdom. And whatever you unlock will be unlo unlocked in heaven and whatever you close or lock on earth will be locked in heaven as well. So God says, listen to me. I give you authority to change things here. I give you the keys, the keys, the kingdom keys to, do, to have that influence. Please don't confuse that with what, we, what we've sometimes experienced in the past. People say, I have the keys of the kingdom. I can unlock and lock and whatever. I hear it sometimes. People say, I unlock this uh, money from heaven into my business. I unlock it. <laughs> I pray, Father, in that account, please. Come and make the, the money fall from heaven there. I unlock that. I unlock this car and this new house. And Father, I describe it in my mind for you so that you understand which house I'm talking about. That, in that street, you take a left. No, come back. You go there. And you, that house or that door, that's what I'm talking. I'm unlocking it in the name of God. No. God says, listen, I give you my kingdom keys. The things that you are exposed to here, my love, my way of running a country, my way of politics, my way of education, my way of treating people and health and business, the way my kingdom works, I give you that keys to do the same on earth. And that's why we pray in Matthew 6, as it is in heaven, the same here on earth. I give you that keys. It's according to my will. It's not for your kingdom, kingdom it's for God's kingdom. And now God says, I will start giving you passions for things here. Things that's out of control, like education, like health, like people not having food, like jobs, like the economy. I'm, I'm going to start to give you keys to unlock those things. But it's not that, that this key is not turned from earth without our power. It's turned from heaven. That's where the power lies. That's from where God is turning this key that we are putting into place. And we have the authority to do that. But remember, it also says when we lock things. So if we decide we're not going to do anything, nothing will happen. Because God planned His kingdom in that way that He wants to use His church to bring that change. So if, he, if we decide to look the other way, those things will continue. Because we feel too weak to address those things. God says, listen, you are the children of the King. You stand in holiness before me. Everything I share with you, that's what he says through my Holy Spirit. All the gifts in heaven, not some of it, all of the gifts I share with you. 
so that this place can be conquered in the name of Jesus Christ through a sustainable kingdom that lives through us into this world. Every day, every morning, it just comes through us. And when we make a mistake and a blunder, like I do many times, we can just move back to our position. It says, Father, thank you that I'm not here because I deserve it. I'm here because of Christ. Thank you, I just made a huge mistake. I was part of something horrible. Thank you. There's no blemish on me. Nothing uh, prohibiting me to come into your presence. I'm welcome. Thank you that the same power that you used through me yesterday, before I was stupid, that same power is still available today. To continue so that people can see it's not about us. It's about God and therefore we can live it. Now it's very important, people, that we know that Satan is not satisfied with that heavenly position. He doesn't like us to be there because he know, knows God will change you. He knows that you are, if you are exposed for a long time in God's presence and you know you live in his presence and that's a reality to you, it will change things on earth. He cannot afford that because actually he's in control of this kingdom. The Bible says he's the prince of this earthly reality. You can just see what's happening all over. Satan is influencing most of the things. So he doesn't like us to influence these things. So all he has to do is to move us from there back to this place. He doesn't care if you are Christian from earth because he knows there's no power in that. He doesn't care. Because he knows he can, he can influence you through all, through all these realities on the earth, all the horrible things. It will put fear on you. It put, will put anger on you. It will uh, dominate your thoughts. So he doesn't have a problem with being a Christian from this uh, earthly place. I said the previous meeting, I said, he doesn't want to convince you to slaughter black cats and become part of that horrible stuff. Huh? That's not his plan. He knows Christians will go, will, won't go there. The only thing he wants is for you to move back to earth from your heavenly position. Because then he can control you. So in faith, we have to reclaim this position every day. Ephesians 6 tells us, stand on your post. Stand in your position. God gave you that wonderful authority and he welcomed you so that we can as holy and righteous people be in his presence so that he can change us and change us together. So that we can march on the symph symphony, on the music of Jesus Christ and his word and his truth into this community as one. Let's, uh, let's uh, what do you call it, uh, fear that, celebrate that uh, more often, this wonderful, just simple truth of what happened to us in Jesus Christ so that his culture can be part of our natural way of living. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this uh, truth, the gospel, uh, the reality of the gospel. It's not just a new message. It's not just uh, a speck of hope in the future. It's a new reality that people like us can live spiritually in your presence. That people like us can be fully holy, 100% righteous. That people like us can be exposed to your presence every day, every second. Father, Come and do your work in us. Give us that faith again so that we can believe it. It's too good to believe. It's too good to be true. But it is the truth in Christ. Help us to believe that so that we can live from your presence and you can influence all of us with a new heavenly kingdom culture. So that, Father, when we go away from this place, Christ will become more and more visible in everything we do and everything we say every way and manner we live in. That you will be glorified. Not because of what we do, but because of what you are doing in and through us. Bless this congregation. May they experience the change in culture. May they experience the energy that's uh, moving them into every place that they are busy with. Everyday life, but also all the other things that they are busy with. That they don't have to encourage people, that, but that you will encourage us from heavenly places. And Father, that we will see this town changed. 
because we are heavenly citizens. That every one of us will bring that change wherever we are in this municipality and everywhere we go. We honor you for that. That we are the victors in Jesus Christ. We expect a change. And all the glory to you. In Jesus' name. Amen.